Wait till she clears the room. OK, go. She's clear. Go, go, go. Now, now, now. Now. This video is sponsored by Mubi. Stick around to the end of the video to see how you can get 30 days free of great cinema. This is The Rehearsal, an HBO show from Nathan Fielder, and it is one of the weirdest things to ever air on television. It's also, honestly, one of the most interesting portraits of social anxiety I've ever seen. The show's premise is patently absurd. Basically, Nathan helps people, in extraordinary detail, rehearse for upcoming life events that might be stressful. At first, these are tough conversations, but that quickly balloons out of control, but more on that as we go in the video. Nathan constructs sets for his rehearsals, and does a truly mind-boggling amount of research to help his subjects prepare themselves. In the first episode alone, he reconstructs the bar his subject, Core, has picked to make his confession in. This is the perfect replica. I mean, that's not even the funhouse version of it. Later in the season, he moves a woman named Angela out to rural Oregon to simulate raising a child, using a rotating cast of child actors that are subbed out seamlessly every four hours for legal purposes, going to ridiculous lengths to not only simulate raising a child, but the decades of time that would pass in the meantime. It can be hard to stay in the moment. So you need to have custom digital mirrors installed that allow you to see yourself age at the same pace as your child. There are a lot of things that the rehearsal is. It's a magic trick. It's an allegory for Judaism. It's a commentary on reality TV, an exploration of Jean Baudrillard's theory of simulation and simulacra. By the way, friend of the channel Thomas Flight did a great video on some of these ideas, which I'll link in the description, but don't watch it yet. Just open another tab. Stay with me. Stay here. Yes. Watch my videos. Juice those audience retention stats. <laughs> those are all really valid readings. But the thing I want to talk to you about is the way the show makes me feel, and the emotion I think the show is really all about. Anxiety. There's no way to watch the rehearsal without feeling anxious. And I'm trying to just yeah. calibrate, because to me it's like, oh, well, that's an anti-Semitic okay, stereotype. Definitely. Yeah, my brother would say a similar thing. It would work, yeah. okay, so, I mean, so. Like, oh, you know, don't be so Jewish, like, to me on things. Yeah, I mean, if that's yeah, how yeah. you communicate, I don't want um, you to use language yeah, no, you that wouldn't um, be effective, so. Yeah, then like so many other shows in this genre of reality comedy, like Sasha Baron Cohen or Eric Andre, it's powered by cringe, the kind that has the habit of forcing you to watch it through your fingers. Ever seen that movie Bird Box? Yeah. Neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back with Judy Greer. But something that sets the rehearsal apart is how Nathan isn't playing some wacky character, a wrecking ball of chaos upsetting the status quo. He's actually quite the opposite. He's nondescript. He doesn't make a public scene. He's very deadpan. He's kind of like the episode of SpongeBob where he tries to become normal. You know, it's a funny thing, Squidward. I smoothed out the edges of my personality and the rest just followed suit. Now I am utterly normal. Nathan isn't trying to stand out and make people feel uncomfortable with his shenanigans. He's trying to fit in. And that's what makes people so uncomfortable on the rehearsal. Nathan seems to be acutely aware of this effect he has on people, and the show at some level is actually about him trying to address that. I've been told my personality can make people uncomfortable, so I have to work to offset that. When you think about it, the rehearsal is the embodiment of that feeling you get when you're falling asleep, replaying every single mistake you've ever made in your entire life and then deciding that that feeling is so uncomfortable that you have to create a duplicate world so that you can prepare for those mistakes and avoid them. Avoiding actual anxiety by experiencing anxiety that is almost indistinguishable from reality. Yeah, yeah I told you the premise was absurd. <laughs> As the show's marketing materials describe it, it's about the lengths one man will go to reduce the uncertainties of everyday life. I had gone to incredible lengths to eliminate all uncertainty from the night. But the only way to know the actual trivia questions that the real host would be asking would involve some sort of cheating. But maybe it's more unethical to leave things to chance when there's something you could have done. 
So posing as the founder of the popular blog Thrifty Boy. It's one of the most over-the-top solutions to anxiety I've ever seen. It'd be much easier to pop a Xanax or, I don't know, put on the 2015 cult classic pop album Emotion by singer-songwriting queen Carly Rae Jepsen. Just spitballing here. The rehearsal is neuroses approached in the most clinical way possible, an attempt to understand human behavior by holding it at arm's length. It's the everyday observations of Seinfeld mixed with the deep psychoanalysis of Mindhunter. It's an artificial intelligence program processing humanity. Nathan doesn't really fit in, so he's constantly trying to figure out ways to game the system and hack the minutia of everyday behavior. But in Nathan's quest to conquer social interactions, he's also sharing with us a very unique perspective on life. In her review of the series, Alyssa Wilkinson writes that criticism is just watching closely and then describing what you see. In that sense, what Nathan is doing on the rehearsal can only be called criticism. It was strange being in a real child's home after being in a fake one for so long. I wasn't used to this level of detail. Every object was perfectly placed, but nothing was by design. It was a work of art, and it was just real life. In some ways, what the rehearsal is doing reminds me a bit of one of the rituals of the Nakarima people. Nearly every day, they insert a small bundle of hog hairs into their mouth, along with certain magical powders, and then move the bundle in a highly formalized series of gestures. Now, what I'm describing is brushing your teeth, and Nakarima is really just American spelled backwards. <laughs> this is a trick designed to get American anthropologists to view their own culture from a distance, and it's something that I think the rehearsal does really well. After spending time with people, I'm often left wondering what they actually think of me. So once the class was gone, I tried a little experiment. I decided to recreate the class using different actors to portray each person so I could relive the day from a student's perspective. Yes, the rehearsal is a comedy with a premise so surreal that Nathan's dedication to it is absurd. But I don't think that Nathan is the butt of the joke necessarily. And I don't think his marks Angela, Cor, or Patrick are either. Huh? Is my life the joke? Do you sit here with your friends at the end of the day laughing at me? No, you're not the joke. Not at all. No, no, no one's the joke. The situations are funny, but interesting too. But this can be like the opportunity to raise your kids in a-, in a yes, rehearsal. Shut up! As Nathan says, the joke is the scenario. And Nathan's dedication to it isn't just absurd to be funny. It makes us rethink why it's absurd. None of us think that it's unreasonable to practice a difficult conversation before we have it. So why does taking it to this extreme feel so strange. The rehearsal forces us to be hyper aware of everything, through the show's mechanics, the artifice of it all, and by focusing on the mundane, Fielder points out the artifice of our own social interactions themselves. Why can't you ask the worker at the acai place what his passions are? Why do we have to create a scenario where that is an acceptable question to ask? You know, you, when you get your order, maybe you spill it on the counter and he would come to your aid and that would break down some of those social barriers that you're afraid to cross. Just disrupt the situation. Yeah, and then maybe, you know, it might lead to a more personal conversation, perhaps. Okay. In the real world, Nathan must hyperfixate on the same things that the show forces us to, only that he finds our world and customs as strange as we find his weird parallel one. The most common phrase on the show embodies this idea, an acceptance of the weirdness of Nathan's scenarios, of society, and of life, all wrapped into one. It's a simulated before experience. Have, yeah, bef before deciding if we want to do it in our real lives. Separately. Okay. Yeah, separately. We wouldn't do it together, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. This is not my baby. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I don't. Okay. Well, my dream's always been to play in the NBA. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. There's something about this phrase that I just find so poetic in the world of the show. It's an everyday response to the truly bizarre with a deadpan affect that betrays a deep anxiety underneath it all. It's a deep swallow as you realize, oh, this is a weird thing that's happening, but nobody seems to be freaking out, so I'm going to pretend it's normal too. What are you doing with the noodles there? I'm seeing how done they are. Oh, okay. But what distinguishes the rehearsal from any other depiction of social anxiety I've ever seen is who I'm calling 
other Nathan. I'm not talking about Nathan, the main character of the show. I'm talking about Nathan, the creator of the show, who is also a character. Let me explain. The rehearsal, more than any other show I can remember, is full of artifice. It's a show that encourages you to think about how it's made. And because of that, I constantly find myself coming back to Nathan, or at least the version of the man that he encourages us to think about. There are layers to Nathan Fielder. On one end of the spectrum, there's the character of Nathan, the person on the show. Let's call him Rehearsal Nathan. He helps people with rehearsals and has epiphanies about human nature along the way. I've been neglecting one key component of every crucial life event, feelings. We can all sense at some level that this is a constructed character. We know this because he is completely unaware of himself in a way that we know real Nathan must not be because the show he's on makes fun of that unawareness. On the other end of the spectrum, there's the real life person, Nathan Fielder, the man who was born in Vancouver, who conceived of and pitched the rehearsal to HBO. Let's call him real Nathan. We as an audience can never really know that guy because we only get to see him through the show. Our perception of him is what I'm calling other Nathan. The persona real Nathan puts forth as a stand-in other Nathan didn't really create the rehearsal. He is also a construction of the show. While the show encourages us to think about what kind of weirdo would create this world, it's not pointing us at real Nathan. It's pointing us at other Nathan. And it's other Nathan that fascinates me the most, a mixture of real and character. While rehearsal Nathan is the exterior version of himself that the show presents, other Nathan is beneath the surface another sort of performance meant to lie in wait for those looking to use the show to get to know real Nathan. Other Nathan is kind of like when you go through an Indiana Jones style temple with booby traps, only to find out that the artifact at the end has been replaced with a replica. But that replica was put there by real Nathan. Other Nathan is designed for those who look beneath the surface level of the show. And I think that the reasons why real Nathan constructed other Nathan are the real heart of the show layers of masks created by his social anxiety. I was starting to wonder how I could so easily create feelings inside other people's rehearsals when I couldn't do it for myself. While rehearsal Nathan seems to be learning about emotions for the first time, the closer you look, the more you can see other Nathan's humanity peeking out from behind the artifice of the rehearsal. Just before the rehearsal debuted on HBO, Fielder was featured in a massive and revealing profile for Vulture. Writer Leela Shapiro followed Fielder around for a few days, carefully detailing their interactions in a way that I'm sure he must respect at some level. I, I mean, the man is a glutton for details. This spice rack, it's the exact spices they have, the garlic. Yeah the basil. This chair is an exact, this, these wow. ropes. In the profile, he's cagey, often redirecting Shapiro to whatever weird thing they're doing at the moment, including going to a live stunt show based on the infamously terrible movie Waterworld. Nathan Fielder is truly one of a kind. But there are also moments where he reveals bits of himself, seemingly almost by accident. He discusses his difficulty making friends as a child, recounting his experience transferring to a large public school as a 13-year-old, saying, I didn't understand how people made friends. At one point, after describing going to therapy after his divorce, he even confesses how much he wanted to lie about the experience to Shapiro. And Fielder's dual instinct to share and hide his true self is present in the show. In the very first episode, he concocts a scenario where he and Kor have a heart-to-heart -heart in a pool about their divorces. This was just laying the groundwork for the main event, the mutual disclosure of personal information in a heated pool. You mentioned you were married? Yes. I was married for five years. Oh, I was married for three years. Oh. Didn't know that. Is it sad for you? I consider it one of my, um, one of the bigger failures in my life. But he also plans an interruption so that he doesn't have to share too much of himself. I didn't want to go too deep into my private life, so I had pre-planned for an elderly swimmer to interrupt us in the hopes that it would convince Kor I was ready to share more had the moment not been ruined. I think this scene is a microcosm for the entire show. Here we are watching Kor interact with rehearsal Nathan, 
seeing him avoid sharing details about himself through a clever distraction. But we're watching this scene unfold with other Nathan, the creator of the show, who explains to us exactly what he's done without revealing any more information. Itself another clever distraction. Other Nathan, by merely existing in his carefully manicured state, is emblematic of the show's statements on anxiety. We can never know what someone else really thinks. We only have our perceptions, which are flawed and easily manipulated. Real Nathan is always able to distance himself from our perceptions of him. But at the same time, by inserting himself so fully in his own experiments, he ends up sharing a lot of himself with the audience. The rehearsals are meant to alleviate anxiety, but throughout the entire show, we can feel Nathan's dripping off the screen. Do you feel like I'm like, believable as a dad? Like... I mean, you're a great scene partner. Good. I'm struck by how Nathan's anxieties manifest in both avoidant and direct ways. After helping a number of people through the rehearsals for their stressful conversations, Nathan throws himself fully into rehearsing fatherhood himself. And this is where the show gets really juicy. Much of Nathan's rehearsal as a father and co-parent involves him being humiliated and called out for failures, both real and concocted by the premise of the show. Okay, so your dad comes home after being gone mm -hmm. for nine years. How do you think you'd really feel? Hey. Look who decided to show up. This feels like a way of dealing with the anxieties Nathan has about being a bad dad in a direct way, especially when compared to Nathan's reveal to the audience that in the past he's been conflict avoidant. My relationship with Angela was starting to parallel real relationships I had had in the past. I have a tendency to let my partner take the reins and make the decisions as a way of avoiding conflict. But Nathan still isn't actually dealing with his anxieties directly here at all. He's just found another clever loophole. By throwing so much time and effort into rehearsing, he's avoiding the actual experience he's rehearsing for entirely. He's not actually connecting with another human being, he's connecting with a character that he's written. All of his own rehearsals have actually already been rehearsed. He's already written them and thought them through. The actors were instructed to launch into a scenario I had scripted. My hope was that I could practice counseling my child through a complex emotional experience, an area where I fear as a real father I may fall short. But the idea of getting these interactions wrong stresses him out so much that he has to play them out this way. It's painfully apparent to the audience that he's never going to actually have any of these experiences, precisely because he needs to act them out this way. Do you want to feel something? Do you want to feel something real? Yeah. That's sad. You never will. Yet, at the same time, Nathan does somehow, despite all odds, hit the right notes throughout his show, both in his rehearsals and in his experience of those rehearsals. He does experience some semblance of fatherhood. He does experience failing in a relationship with Angela. So I'm sorry. I'm the, it, I, I was the problem, not you. Mm. I appreciate you saying that. I think what the rehearsal shows us is that there's no way around the uncomfortable emotions and anxieties of life. You have to accept your lack of control at some level. And while Nathan isn't actually having an honest relationship with these things directly, this show, the rehearsal, is the closest he can get. He can't be fully vulnerable. I think his anxiety might actually prevent him from doing that. Nathan has a problem with lying. He lies a lot. So he creates a persona in order to engage with conflict and emotions in a way where he still feels in control. An illusion that is so complete that the audience is always at least two levels removed from the actual feelings that Nathan is dealing with, his loneliness, his grief, his anxiety. I'm sorry, I am who I am. And I am who I am. Right. How does this keep happening to me? What else can you do when you're trying your best? And the show is full of these little paradoxes, the need to be seen and the mortifying ordeal of being known. It is both real and fake, profound and silly, 
empathetic and totally exploitative, introspective and seeking connection. Somehow, all of these things can be true about both the rehearsal and about life. It's scary and overwhelming. But even if you have an HBO budget, the only way to deal with it is ultimately to swallow hard, nod your head, and say... Oh, okay, okay, yeah. got it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. It must be a lonely experience for Nathan to always feel apart from things and it reminds me a bit of the Italian documentary film Il Solengo which tells the story of Mario, a man who has spent his life living in a cave about an hour outside of Rome. Unlike Nathan, he has no interest in fitting in. But just like Nathan, he is a social outcast, a complete enigma to the townspeople who see him. His story is told almost exclusively through first-hand accounts of those townspeople, which gives almost an inverse portrait of the same kind of anxiety, loneliness, and grief that the rehearsal comes from. And Il Salengo is now streaming in the US on this video's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service where you can watch interesting and incredible cinema from around the globe, which I feel like always gives me a really interesting and unique perspective on things. You're always in great hands with Mubi's excellent team of curators, and their catalog is filled with stuff from all over. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash skip intro. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash skip intro for a whole month free of great cinema. As always, thank you so much for watching. You can like this video, you can share it, you can subscribe it. You can also support the channel on Patreon, which helps me with big research projects like my Copaganda series and gets you bonus material, early access, TV reviews, and monthly Q&As. It's a, it's a great time. Thanks again, and I'll talk in your general direction next time.